Thanks very much for the time. Um, I'm not going to do a big intro this time. Uh, what's your organization actually called? Is there a name? Asian Financial Protection. Yeah, it? it's it's a sexy title we've got for today. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Accurate. I like it's it. straight to the point. Yes. Um, so yeah, I'll let you guys get straight into it. Um, yeah, feel free to ask questions as it goes. We're going to hopefully record this one well. Uh, if it saves, which it doesn't, just completes uh, evidence. Um, yeah, please get involved and yeah, go for it. Cool. All right, thank you. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, so uh, we're from Datacom. Uh, my name's Peter Cooney. I'm manager of uh, Modern Workplace across Datacom. If you don't know anything about Datacom, Datacom uh, is actually a New Zealand company. Uh, there's 5,000 of us around the world. We operate in about seven or eight countries. And to my left, we've got Simon Payne. Simon Payne's my uh, lead consultant in uh, Microsoft. Modern Workplace or M365 staff specifically, and in a former life he was an enterprise vault guru, uh, amongst other things. So we do a lot of transitions and transformations into M365 across the country and across the world. Um, and uh, between me and him, we've got like, about 20 years of experience across these sort of technologies. Um, and we're here today to talk about um, Azure Information Protection. But just before that, we'll kind of get into what we do. Just as a kind of a view of what one workplace is, it's really a Microsoft construct. A lot of people call it digital, digital workplace, or digital workspace, uh, Microsoft call it one workplace. We'll take a net name on as well. We don't want to confuse the market, so we call ourselves one workplace team. There's a the little things or the sort of uh, knowledge domains we cover, and um, you know it's all wrapped up into into that productivity play, collaboration play. So what we do is we put Microsoft 365 as a cornerstone of customer's digital transformation success. This solution set, which I'm sure you're all touching, is running Office 365 to some degree, or Azure AD or something like that, right? So it's pretty core to what everything you do or what users touch every day. So it's not a back end system that we see, it's pretty much at the front, so um, it has a, it's a high touch point. It's driven by these sort of uh, trends in the workplace, right? Least IT control. Stuff service IT, shifting left, um, flexible workspaces, and that can mean many things to some people. When we first started this team, somebody came to me and goes, great, I've always wanted somebody to come and do an architecture inside of an office, and you guys do huddle spaces and lighting and stuff. I said, not that sort of architecture. <laughs> so that uh, means different things to different people, but in a sense, it's about um, mobile. Uh, and more teamwork. More people collaborating across the business and virtual teams coming together for the and Microsoft see this stuff, and we see it too, you know. Just to say, help keep me secure, but then I'm drowning security. It's getting in the way. Uh, I need to do more with less, I want happier users. That's a really interesting one, right? Because I think we're guilty in IT of forgetting the users sometimes and worrying about the system to look after. We want to be more strategic, and they want uh, balanced control and flexibility. So, I guess the topic today is actually one that really touches on that, which is. It's one where you're trying to allow people to do their job, but maintain that security posture, really, regardless of where anything lives. So Simon will, will demo some of that stuff. So this is really Microsoft security vision, showing security now with digital transformation through a comprehensive uh, platform, unique intelligent board partnership. So who's running a lot of the EMS stack, or who's got any of the E365 stuff going? So Intune, Azure AD, Conditional Access, Anybody running AIP? Yeah. But they're all things together with their you know, security compliance center, their threat intelligence dashboards, their cloud app security that really create quite a compelling security narrative across their suites. And uh, I think typically if you thought of Microsoft and security, you'd think TMG server, right, or ISA server. It's well beyond that. The days of just protecting your network and just managing the perimeter is gone because your data is up in the cloud. So the problem is, you know, how do we enable productivity without compromising security? That, that's, that's the challenge. Because you can secure something and then it's completely unusable, right? What ends up happening is users will bypass that security pretty easily. I might just move my little camera on. So, process approach, four pillars, identity and access management, threat protection, information protection, which we're talking about today, and uh, security management. Also, we will touch on that, probably that fourth point as well. 
So that's the themes for it, and then underneath there, as I guess, is the actual solutions that that uh, make that possible. And uh, you know, identity is a foundation. Protecting that with hello and friendship guard. Threat protections have got insights and proactive uh, attention and monitoring of that. Info protection. We're going to talk about these two today, which is information protection, data security. Sorry, Azure information protection, data security. And then uh, you know, a little bit of this stuff, which is really just more the, the analytics and things. Yeah. Yes, way. I am sorry for my limited knowledge, but just yeah. want to understand means the topic of the today's discussion. Uh, Microsoft is means like now no longer into the desktop application. Mainly they are focusing on the cloud part. But the whatever we are discussing, are we talking about the hybrid environment where the some of the application customer hosting are the premises and some of the cloud environment, or purely we are talking about the cloud environment where the SaaS, PaaS, or it will become more clear as we present. The cool thing about Azure Information Protection, it doesn't matter where the data lives. Okay. okay. Doesn't matter where the data lives. So it doesn't matter. In that sense, but it'll come clearer as we go on, on what we're talking about. Okay. Thanks. Cool. So, yeah, the beauty of this topic of today and this solution, which is Azure Information Protection, it'll work with the data lives. Okay. But yes, it's a lot easier and this stuff works better if your information's on the cloud. <laughs> okay, so AIP. Right, so it's a really around detection and prevention of threats, control of data, saving files to non approved cloud storage. Yeah. You might think, well, I've turned on OneDrive, I've turned on SharePoint, that's really loud cool stuff. But what actually mandates that? And if something does get out, how do you control it? Simon will show you some of those things. Uh, IP is the well, data is the new oil, right? So it's important to secure it because it has real intrinsic value now. Uh, and then accidental is more likely than malicious. Breaches due to lack of internal controls. Two weeks ago, I was in a call, early morning call with lawyers around a notified data breach. One of our customers. Now, luckily, we didn't notify them because uh, it turned out that the data wasn't leaked, but it's actually a reporting responsibility on any organization in Australia and will come into effect in May. So we all have responsibility to protect this stuff. It's generally around personally identifiable information. Names, addresses, bank accounts, tax numbers, that sort of stuff. So AOP or Azure Information Protection has been around for a while, quite a long time. Its genesis is in uh, information rights management, which has been in the product since 2003, which I think 15 year history. Okay, and that was around encryption and access control of documents. I've extended that out. You can now track documents and revoke access. And then I've gone further again and classify and label the stuff automatically based on the content. It's really cool. That's when you start getting really smart about it. G'day, come join us. Oh, yeah. Good, good. So you've got three concepts there classification, labeling, protection, monitoring, and response. As a life cycle, as a uh, as a as a thing, it's, it's all of these things at once. It's something that when I we demo, I think is really really neat. Now, you can't do this without having some business rules behind it, because you need to say why you classify. And what's the concept? Right. And you potentially don't want to take the responsibility of classifying everything without having a reason to do. So it needs input from the business. And you know, they need to say what should be protected, what should be allowed, what should be confidential, what is top secret, whatever classification you want to call it. Uh, but it needs their input. And then you design the system based on those business rules to support those business rules. Can't do it, it can't be an IT function. You don't know what the data is, right? You could make an educated guess, but uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't take it on yourself. It is. It's to their support business function. So typically you'd start with one department. Don't try and eat the whole apple at once, right? Good one to start with is nature. They'll tell you exactly right away what should be protected. Now, just quickly on this point, you mentioned about hybrid or cloud and how far your journey is into that way. And I said, well, it doesn't matter where the data lives, right? 
but let's explore what we have at the moment. How does how's most data secured right now? NTFS permissions, yeah? You've got folders, you've got folder structures, you've got groups behind it that restrict access to those locations, yeah? So what happens if I have read access? Can't edit it, but I can read it, right? So if I can read it, it means I can copy it, which means I can move that file and put it somewhere where I have full access to what I like with it. So the entire security posture of everybody's stuff is built on trust. Okay? And it works pretty well because people aren't necessarily nefarious and they'll just be nice people and they won't do bad stuff, right? Good. But this is a way to enforce it and make sure it does happen rather than just go on and put the trust that we use. Which for a lot of data is fine, but there's some stuff there's just no way I should ever get it. So I'm going to flip over to Simon now, let him talk. Simon's going to show you this stuff real time, really working. Okay? So he's going to protect some documents, going to show you some scenarios, he's going to talk you through an even much better idea about what I'm just talking about. We're then going to jump into the cloud app security, which will show you how to track all this stuff. Then we'll make talk questions at the end. I'm happy to, uh, you know, to present and I'll jump out. Already, happy to take questions at any time if you're lost or you. Already this has failed. I can't so bring up my PC. No, we need to change. I did. Here. I changed the file. Right. Input one. Oh, input one. Sorry. I'll stop presenting. You present. You don't want primary monitor? Where are you no, going to do your work? One. You're going to do your work on that no. one? Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm just going to quickly move these three uh, VMs. I've got some VMs which I'll quickly move up here. Can the people on the line here, Simon? I'm not really talking clearly yet, so I'll talk louder in a second. Looking good and sounding good, guys. All right. Cheers. Looking good is the important bit. <laughs> All right. So I've got three different VMs here running, all of different scenarios. Do you want to sit? Would that make you feel? Good? No, yeah. I'd behind the monitor too much. Okay. The trouble is, guys, so I, I won't lie, this desk is made for someone who's five foot. Um, I'm not five foot, so it's a bit uncomfortable for me to bend down and talk. So it's too, too small for me too, yeah. <laughs> um, so Pete mentioned before about AIP. Uh, not many of you put up your hand to say you've implemented it. Uh, did anyone implement the old information rights management and there's a good reason no one did because it was not user friendly and for both the users and IT it was painful. They've simplified dramatically now. AIP basically uh, adds a user interface for the users and a much better back end interface for the IT which obviously you guys care about the most. So what I've got is I've got three scenarios here I'm going to go through and uh, the first one's uh, uh, based on the fact that you want to share something something with a, a client or someone internal that you don't want them to pass on. It's for their eyes and their eyes only. Whether that be an internal user, whether it be an external customer, a vendor, doesn't make a difference. It's exactly the same scenario. And so what we've got here is I've got this user, which is actually my HR user. No, wrong screen. Uh, this one here. So I've got this HR user and they have a document here. Now, at the moment, this is a plain document. It's just something I prepared earlier, so I didn't have to write out text and uh, show you how badly I can't spell. So it's just launching. And you will see this extra bar at the top, which is added by the AIP client. Uh, I'll get to that in a second in the second demo. But for this stage, we are just going to do a a do not forward option, which basically protects the document uh, and the email, and the user cannot forward that email. They can't um, print it or screenshot it, and I'll show you some examples of that. So that's just, a, at the moment, it's called unclassified. That's just a label. It's got no protection whatsoever. So saying, please don't classify that document. So save that down, and we will, in fact, I will make a change to it. Purely, so it comes up in my recent history of documents. And so now You'll be pleased to know that all these, all these VMs are hosted in Azure. 
No AWS hosting here. Yeah, with my custom domain name, as you can see. Uh, and so this HR user, I'll, I'll go through three um, users today. HR user, sales user, and my own personal user, which is an ex treat that like an external customer or vendor. But this one here, what we're going to do, we're going to send a new email, which I've actually got as a draft already. Again, so I don't have to do it here. Test one, please do not forward this. So I will pop that out just to make it easier. And you've got these classifications at the top. But what we're going to do is we're going to actually click a do not forward button, which is you can turn it off for users if you want to, but it's, this requires no configuration apart from that. Is it's, it's either on for users or it's not. You can control it by policy. Can you attach a file? Now I will attach a file, and we attach that file that I just had. Ah, <laughs> demo gods are not doing me well. So is that because I'm not syncing? No, it's syncing. So I'll just try to touch that in the old-fashioned way. Work that time. And so I've got the do not forward. And I'm just going to send that to both my external user and my internal user. And so what I'm going to do now is switch to my other internal user who should receive this email very shortly. There we go. Now you'll see this big red X, a big red, no, sorry, big circle. That just means it's now protected. It's got encryption on it. I can still open it because I have access. So it's sent to me and I can oh, open that up in a simple window, make it a bit easier to see. The size are right for everyone. You can read text and stuff there. So uh, it's still classified as unclassified, so it didn't change the classification, but you can see here it's got the do not forward option. You'll see the forward buttons grayed out, and you can see I can also can't print. If I was to reply to this email, I can't even change the recipients, because otherwise that would be the same as a forward almost. So it's very strict about what I can do, and if I open up the attachment, it automatically protects the document as well. So if someone saved this document to a USB stick and took it somewhere else, still couldn't open it. It's only because I have the permission to open this document. If I could view permission, it shows me exactly what permission I've got access to. You can actually stop uh, screenshotting of that as well. I will actually, I've even got a snippet here for okay. that very purpose. Perfect. I'm going to take a screenshot of that document. Oh, it disappears as soon as you go and you screenshot. So who can think of the method to get it? I have a camera then. Ah, a camera. <laughs> Can't stop everything. Can't stop everything. <laughs> but that does show intent. Isn't that the OneNote one as well? OneNote screen clipping? And uh, you should it, use the same. It would be clipping. whether you use GreenShot, whether you use any screenshotting application. Yep. Well, the so Windows, Windows S key is now does it in, um, in Windows 10. So, yeah, if you've got it on your phone as well, try and screenshot your phone, your phone will be stopped from making that action as well. Now, if I go to my external user, the difference between the external user and the internal user in this situation is my internal user has got the AIP client pushed out to it. So at the moment, AIP client is a separate install, but Microsoft, I, I believe, has the intention to push that out and combine it with Office. Um, but at the moment, it's a separate install. But you only need the AIP client to classify, not to open protected content. So if I open that same email in my external user, which is just here, you'll see I can't see, I'll open the actual email, I can't see that banner that was up there about what label was attached, uh, but I can still open the content, no problem. With the same protection. Exactly the same protection. So, a couple of things here. I can protect information but still send it to somebody outside the organisation and still maintain that protection. That's pretty cool, right? No logins, no mucking about, no signing into portals, no here's a key and here's a one-time password. Protect the information. 
you're going to get a different experience internally because it can read the label that he applied. But it, the more important bit is that whoever is the recipient, and in this case it's Duno Forward, so that recipient can't be added to, then you're protected. So it's pretty cool. Now, obviously, uh, end users have to authenticate. So if you're asking it to external users, uh, most companies these days have Azure AD or Office 365 services. Um, if they don't, they should, because it shouldn't cost them a single cent to set up a, their own tenancy with no licenses and set up AD Connect to, to synchronize. Um, and I, I find it hard to believe many companies haven't even attempted to do that yet. But even in case there are some, they, they still can get access by setting up a Microsoft account. Um, Microsoft made a change recent, uh, probably a, a while ago now, and someone in the room can probably correct me on this if I'm wrong, but you can't create a Microsoft account now if you already have an Azure AD account. So Microsoft wants to start pushing people with corporate accounts not to use a, uh, a Microsoft account anymore. Next demo. All right, so that's demo number one. Um, so next one. This scenario is what we've got is we're going to have the company's having a secret party and they don't want uh, anyone uh, outside the organization to know. I don't um, want Simon to come. <laughs> they're basically having a corporate shutdown, but they don't want their customers to know they're shutting down because they're going to be on and stuff. So um, I'll just switch to my HR user. Now, this is where I'm going to actually give a bit more detail about current labels. So here's my, um, I'll bring up company secret. And here's an, another unprotected document. At the moment, it's unclassified. Now you'll see it's classified as unclassified because I've set a policy to say all, for HR user, all documents must be classified and the default one is unclassified. But you can purely not make everyone have a label if you don't want to. You can um, also not set a default label and people have to actually manually set it when they save documents. But um, you'll see here I've got unclassified and um, and you can change the different labels. So if I say I've got internal only, you'll see I've got unclassified at the top there. I've changed that to internal only. You can have watermarks. Uh, you can so have- To be clear, that's changing the format of the Word doc. Yes. As a header and a footer or page elements. So as a, another example, if I go to HR Confidential, which I'll use in a later demo, it adds a watermark. And if I change this one to HR Controlled, change the HR control back. Uh, so, so they're not elements that somebody can then go type over, they're enforced by the, the policy. So by the classification, you, it applies a, a right, right, like a permission, but it can also modify the document to reflect that. So with the formatting or the doc, or the, as you said, the watermark or the color of the text or whatever. And this applies to Excel, Word, Share, uh, PowerPoint and emails in Outlook. Um, you see here, I've had a high protection classification, I lowered it. And so I have another policy that says, you'll get a lower classification, you have to put justification in as to why. Now, when I was setting up these demos uh, on the weekend, uh, I, I was logging in the system, then when I logged in yesterday, I noticed about a new feature. That's how Microsoft is, they just, all of a sudden just pop up and all of a sudden it's there. As of yesterday, you can now have the public preview that I've noticed of centralized logging, which means you can have all the logs for all your clients go to a uh, log analytics in Azure. Previous to that, they log to the local machine. And now that's okay if you've got access to pull the logs off the local machine, but if you're an external user, then you won't know if they've lowered the classification, if they, ha if they had access to, or someone on their home PC. So all these can now be centrally managed. Um, I'm just going to put something silly. So what I'm going to do, just for the sake of this demo though, I'm going to move this one as unclassified. In fact, I'll mark it to public. And I'm going to save that. I go back to my email. I've got my other draft email I had here. 
Now you can see here that the current classification of the email is unclassified. If I attach a document, it's automatically changed it, the email, to match the classification of what the document is. It says, well, that document is classified as uh, public, then you may as well classify the email as public as well. And that's obviously customizable. But I, in this situation, want to make this one. You can also, you, all these labels are purely customizable. You can write whatever you want. Uh, you can have different levels. I didn't account for popping out so I can get them all. If you hover over HR, so if you hover over these, you can control all this help text. Makes it very easy to tell customers or users what label should be applied when and possibly what protection is applied to those labels. So here you can say here, HR users have owner access. All other internal users have read and reply access. So that means external users have no access. Let's change it to that. And I'm yeah, going to have a second. I've already done it. It's part of my draft. My draft. So you, yeah, so he's also going to see, so he's just told you that there's no rights oh. for an external user. True. And he's added an external user as a recipient. Sorry. I just as a proof concept, so say I accidentally added that person I shouldn't have forgotten. Oh, I shouldn't have sent that that person. Oh no, now I have to ring them up and say, don't read the email, you're not supposed to have that. But no, because it's protected, that won't be the case. Who's had somebody ring up trying to recall an external email? <laughs> How yeah. often is that recall successful? Well, <laughs> you can't recall external email, right? You can only recall an email that's still in your exchange system. So there's really no recovery if you accidentally seen an external email. I had a lady come to me one day and said, and a half going, I need to recall an email. And I said, who'd you send it to? And I said, you don't have any chance. I said, why do you want to recall it? She said, I didn't say uh, pencil me in for that meeting. I said, penis me in. I said, just, uh -huh. let, it, just let it go. Just don't worry about it. We could have done it anyway because it's an external recipient. But how many this is a way to control that. How many people here have had a, uh, a recall notice come in saying someone attempted to recall this email? Yes. And then it makes you go, now I'm really going to read it. That's right. So <laughs> that has really the opposite good. effect. And okay. can you send the email? Uh, yep. Yeah. So this is now, as soon as I flip this up, sent this email, go back to my inbox, secret party, and I can open up this document. So there's nothing new about this, nothing different really. I see HR controlled. And that user's a member of the And HR this user group. is not a member of the HR oh, group. Okay, so, they so they're an internal read. user, so they can only read this email. Yep. yep. So now, that's pretty cool, right? In one policy, you have differentiated levels of access based on your security, which is cool, based you, on your users. You can actually limit it to external domains as well. So you can say the whole of that domain. So no matter who logs in from that domain, you don't have to name every user. You can actually have the entire domain if you're sharing with external companies. So that you always deal with, right? That you're always sharing information with. It could be get exhausting to always add them. You could basically whitelist a whole domain and say they are allowed at least this permission. Now, while I am in this user, I will go back here. And if I go to add a new email myself, oh, new email. You'll see the labels I get. I don't get the HR ones because I'm not in HR. This is a sales user. So uh, you can scope who gets access to what labels. And you'll see that I can remove a label because I said sales users could remove labels, but I said the HR users couldn't. That's not necessarily how you would set it up in your organization, but you can. So the external user just conscious of time. Okay. Uh, this one, external user. And here, if you click on this, oh, won't even let me read it. It says, no, you don't have access. I'm going to try and open that up. And it says, uh, who do you want to log in as? I say myself, it says, that user doesn't have access. So you can't add. Unless I add in my HR user with obviously their credentials, that would open it up. But I don't wish to do that. Pretty cool, right? So you don't have to protect the method of transmission, right? You just need to protect the data. You can scope it to users in the label or by the recipients of the message. You've got two options there. So, so would that work with Thunderbird or 
So you need an email client that can interpret and read um, AIP protected um, documents. So it's typically an Outlook experience. Uh, a lot of the mail clients on the phone support AIP, but there's a third party. You can still get on mobile phones, you can still get AIP app, the viewer, it's a separate yeah. app. So usually in those other applications like uh, your old native apps, you'd have to double click the email and it says, okay, how do you wish to view this encrypted message? And you have to open up in the AIP viewer. So same as when you go a Word document. Now, uh, recently, you used to have to open up all documents in the AIP viewer. Now you can just use the native apps on your phone from Office. Um, yeah, but, uh, but older Win32 mail clients, I think you're out of luck. They will still support standard S-MIME stuff, right? Message encryption, but they're not going to support this. But remember... So it would still receive the email, yep. but it would just be jumbled text basically. Yeah, but remember, if you can't open it, you can't get the attachment. So Outlook, Word, blah, 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 all know about AIP or, or um, uh, rights management protected documents, okay? So they can open them. But if you can't get the initial message, then they're not going to have much stuff there. You can always open it. Oh, we'll talk later about a lot of the web it's hot on the discussion. Uh, we've got one more demo we're going to push yep. on. So we're going to do MKS. Um, okay, very quickly. To extend this question, yes. as you mentioned, like uh, if third party carrier like a Mozilla Thunderbird yep. doesn't have AIP, they cannot open. Now, if suppose my organization has any sister organization or yep. any third party, yep. which are unfortunately not using the Microsoft yep. products, uh, then if I have to send a mail and if it is protected with AIP, yep. then again it's an issue, right? Yeah. So, but you've got a good chance they will have Outlook. You've got an even better chance they will have Word, okay? No one's so, getting denied. So, so if not, you've got the option of the ARP viewer software, and coming soon will be the ability to view them on the web. I've got the Outlook. But you, you're talking, in my experience, you're talking about a scenario that's not that widespread, and obviously if you're in that and you want to mandate that software and that security, then you might be able to force your partner to, to, to do that. I guess uh, Outlook web client will open. Coming. 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 Not currently, coming. Yeah, okay. coming. So uh, what we've got, the third situation here is we've got, um, this is obviously a HR user and they want to advise of another um, a user in the organisation that maybe not be performing quite well. And obviously you don't want that to get out around outside of HR. So here's a document that they're sending to all of HR. Um, and that will we make it is not quite uh, performing, so um, we need to make sure. So what I've got here is I've got a text trigger that says if you detect the word private. Now, obviously, this is customable, you, customizable. You can use regular expressions. You can use um, various different um, string, string patterns um, to detect. But I've got, just got the word private as an example. Oh, so you might cut yourself out if you use such a simple label. You might use the word private but not in a sense, and you know, it might end up automatically classifying a document. But this is the trigger for it. Yeah. So you can either make it automatic or recommended. In this situation, I've made it automatic. So it automatically says, I'm changing that to HR confidential. So he's typing a document, he's used the word private, he's hit say, AIP's kicked in and gone, I've got to look for a certain word. It's found the word private and gone, right, the rule matches. It says, if I see that, I've got to, I've got to classify it, which is what it's done. Yeah. What happens, and so here you can see. Sorry, what happens if you've got multiple classifications within a document? Uh, I would say first, that. First one, one it, Yeah, I'd say there's a hierarchy. There's policies that go down. And so the, the lower of the policies is considered more important, I believe. So can we customise that to like match the ASD federal standard? So can we customise that to like match the ASD federal standard for doctor classifications? Absolutely. Yep. You can. It's going. It's, it's still. You know, this is automatic classification, right? Yes. Yeah, with with an override. Got, yeah. If we've got protected and someone suddenly chucks in unclass DLM or official, because it's now official instead of four officials. Yeah. It's making sure the document takes the correct classification. Yeah. yeah. In this instance, my understanding is that it will take the least privileged model. But there's more than one rule match that will give the one that's least privileged. But if you add in the word official, you imagine how many people use your word official and you don't want that yeah, protected in every document. Yeah, but it's worth us looking at that sort of triggering concept to make sure we get one of the, So normally when we deploy AAP, most of the time goes in the rule testing. 
and the data governance model to fit the rules. The actual deployment and pushing out AOP viewer clients and that's that's nothing, right? Yeah. It's all in the model of what the combinations and the policies want to do. It's really consulting piece. So for this one, we're not going to do anything within our email. We're going to show it via out or no via OneDrive, sorry. But prior to that, I want to show you the explorer menu for AIP, which is classify and protect. And this is where you can actually protect lots of you can actually select 10 documents and say apply this one label so you can do them in bulk there's an aip scanner that can go on your on-premise file servers and apply um based on your rules that you have um, could, be to do in bulk. could be the keywords that you triggered before but there's ways to on mass classify documents that are on still on a file server. so what we can't see here is Conscious of time is there a way? Yeah, well, I'm trying to spring this down a bit for some reason. I can't seem to, it's going to ruin my demo. What are you going to do? Uh, are you trying to do? Ah, trying to pick these. Oh, there's a, there. No, that's not what I'm trying to do. There's a thing at the top here that I can't get to for some reason. Um, bring it down. I'm, I can't even stuff. bring it. I have to, it's an RDP window, so it's probably the same there. Right, scrap that demo. What are we going to do? Talk about no, it. It's all right. I'll do it. I'll do it. Show you the other way of doing it. Right. Three. Let's open it up. And what we've got is a track and revoke. So this is where you can actually track who can access, uh, who's accessed these documents. So this particular document, what we're going to do, I'll show you these other bits later after someone's been there. But for now, we're just going to notify me when anyone tries to open this email or this document. Just the end user that'll get an email back when the uh, document's accessed. All right. So he's going to share this via OneDrive. It helps when I type correctly. Sales user. No message. There we go. Yeah. And so here's the link to say someone shared this document with me. So I'm going to open this up, which is the same as opening up in their OneDrive. Now, this is where you can't open documents, AIP documents in Office Online at this stage. But that's coming. So it's saying, ah, oh, this is protected, so you need to open this up in Word. That's the previous one, so don't think that's it. And it's basically saying, again, you try to access this, you don't have access. Now, if we go back to the HR user, which hopefully the email, well, I can't get my mouse down. There we go. This is a document you just told, email me if somebody tries to open it. You put the track and trace option on that document. I did. Oh, I could go. There you go. It sent me a message saying this person tried to open that document. Click here to view tracking information, which I will do. And I can see one person was denied. No one has successfully accessed it. I can list all the times that people have opened it, whether it be successful or unsuccessful, or the timeline about if you want to see what, who opened it in terms of a mass mail round or something, where in the world they were, for some reason, because it was you, right? I'm in the US. Is that where your VM is? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be where his egress point is. For oh, it's a public public IP, so maybe. Yeah. Yep. Most so, and network. even better, I can revoke access, which means anyone who has access to that document, I can just take it away from them. Now, that's an end user control. So, good segue. We're going to quickly show you Microsoft One quick thing, if you just go up one level, you can see all documents you've protected. Yeah, so you can start yeah. with one and move up. It will... So if you add multiple documents you've shared, you can go up a level and see other. So good segue, right? So yeah. that's the end user control. 
Do you want to stop sharing or jump Sure. In? Cheers. As the end user initiated trap and trace control revoke sort of action, right? But as an IT person, as a technical <coughs> compliance officer in your business, you possibly really want um, to do this on a bigger scale or be notified based on some rules. I'll give you a good example. We'll put this in a place in a, in a company that's... Um, input 2. Yeah, input 2. Yeah, that one? yeah. We'll put this in a place and we just need to share the screen. I did that, I think. We did it already. We've got inception. Yep, good stuff. It's a civil engineering firm. They had a big problem. With architects grabbing all their CAD files or bridges and dams and stuff and buggering off to the next guy. Big problem. They said, how do we know when this is happening? How do we stop it? So we put an AIP. They've now got a rule that basically says, you download more than 10 files at once, we're alerting the, the business. Right? And even better, because they've classified it and at least given an unprotected status, they can revoke that access at any time. And they can actually see where it is stored and in what cloud services it's being stored. You can see the IP of where it's coming from. It's all track and trace. So cloud security has heaps of functions. It does more than just that. It's got three functions. Ready? Shadow IT. You can pump in your firewall logs. It'll tell you everything anybody's doing. It knows about 16,000 different SaaS applications. It'll tell you where your users are going. Hey, Adam's using Dropbox. Hey, that whole team over there is using Trello. Did you know that? Uh, from there, you can take actions based on the security score that Microsoft have given. You either block access to it when you use it as a proxy, or you can start at least informing users going, why is it trailing or block payment? Please stop that. Okay? Give you the visibility that probably your firewall logs at the moment aren't giving you. Pretty cool. Sanctions, so visibility control, compliance and regulations is pretty much what we're talking about now. And then there's the whole uh, integration of the app security model where you use it pretty much as a proxy. Uh, so, discovery. Now, who's got E3? Who's got E3 EMS? Not just E3, E3 EMS. That sort of comes in, yeah. You can get the discovery portion of it, which is that, um, which is the shadow IT assessment by pumping it your uh, file logs. Pretty cool. So data controls that we're talking about today, threat protection is sort of a combination of those two things, discovery and data control. I'm going fast and I'm conscious of time. So, yep, discover, I think it's now 16,000 SAS apps. Identify all the users using it, the IP addresses, the top apps, the top users, the whole lot. You might not, not know that you've sanctioned OneDrive, maybe we've had to use OneDrive, but everybody's using Dropbox. Right? Uh, and it knows how to classify. Anybody try to read a firewall log and you get like a million hits for Facebook with all these different URLs and it's just a mess and you go, I can't, I'm, the horse is bolted. This will just show that Facebook, bang, it knows what all those service points are. It can risk score it based on their. Um, Posture, it'll know if they have Australian data centers. It'll know if the data egresses out in the country you don't want to deal with. It'll actually, you can actually say, hey, does this meet GDPR compliance straight off the bat? No, it doesn't. Cut that off. And some ongoing analytics. It's pretty cool. So data control, it's a bit we'll show you, so we won't touch on this slide too much, but we'll show MCAS uh, live demo in the console and what we can do. Uh, and then this sort of behavioral analytics and attack detection. This is when you create your own rules that Allow it, the service to alert you when you're seeing patterns that you, that you don't want to see, right? As you take an action. Pretty cool. Let's do a demo. Back to Simon. Out. So, we're in the setup sharing again, guys. No, I need to put that in first. So, it's, well, while you're just setting that up. Yep. Um, the whole track and trace thing yep. eventually falls apart once a document goes offline, does it? No, because if the document's you offline, you can't open it. You can't, it can't even open it. No. Okay. It has to go back to the control point in Azure and go, are you allowed? Every time you open it. Yeah. So it's more it's more kind of <laughs> so I flew down to Sydney the other day on a plane with, with open internet. The days of not being online are very limited, right? Yeah. Um, and if you're not online, you're probably on holidays, so don't bother doing any work. <laughs> so, yeah, I get your point, but yeah, no, it doesn't fall apart. It doesn't go, oh, I can't connect, so you're allowed to. No, it 
they can't check it. So, okay. cool. so encrypted with FIT 124 encryption. I don't really know what it means, but that's the standard they use. Um, I'm sure somebody could crack it somewhere, but may have to be some juicy data on that file right at the bottom. Uh, <coughs> the, point, the cool point is that with this system, um, it'll show it no matter where it lives. Okay, because it's seeing those phone homes, hey, do I have access? Who am I? Prove yourself. Okay, you've got this, this right to the phone. Let's go. Nice All right. Um, so this is your main dashboard. So what uh, I've done here, I've uploaded the firewall logs from our uh, own demo environment. It's not a heavily used environment. It's only used for demos, so it doesn't have a lot of real data in it, but has some. And unfortunately, our environment doesn't have authentication for our proxy. Uh, so we can't detect who the user is. We're going to detect the IP it's coming from. So it, it can uh, do it. Yeah, it definitely can do it. Uh, just not enabled on our side. So um, just so you know quickly, the firewall logs can upload any vendor. 50 odd vendors supported. If you've got some obscure firewall that it's got a weird log format, you can pretty much ship that to Microsoft. They'll write the filter for it so it'll work in fact security. But every, everything that's you know, name brand is support. Your Palo Alto, your Fortinet, your Cisco's, your yeah, all of them. So here's oh, yep. so oh, well, it's just a just there, you still have to configure yeah. you've got to ship it. Well, what are the methods? Is it together, um, together. Yeah. If you want to do manual. Yeah. So all you do is just export your log files from the firewall, and then you say, create a report, here's my firewall logs. Bang, that's it. If you want it to be automatic, uh, you used to have to use some sort of um, weird thing there. It brings up a VM, it uses containers. They try and push it towards containers now on Microsoft Windows to basically grab it on the firewall and, and push it up. Um, so it's possible, okay. Yes. So um, here, no. here's um, some various apps that have been discovered, and you go, oh, well, I want to see who's using Dropbox. So this is where it would normally tell us who the user is. Unfortunately, that's not going to be the case. Um, that's why it says no active users, but it can tell me the IP address in, in our instance. Who's using Dropbox? We go, oh, we don't sanction Dropbox. We don't want people to use Dropbox. So they should be using OneDrive. So we can actually um, investigate that further. Now, Microsoft actually uh, rate all these applications for you. Um, Surprise, surprise, AWS is rated badly. <laughs> um, but basically, uh, if you go to your catalog here, it's got various 16,000 apps in there, and they look at all, uh, various uh, compliance about whether they uh, meet certain criteria. Uh, I'll find it on Microsoft One. But you can you can rate it as well. You might have your own needs that are higher than what Microsoft rate, and you can, you can self-rate those as well, I believe. So that's the discovery portion of it. And it tells you here what yeah. it supports. What it doesn't, doesn't do SAML. And so anyone here use Zscale? Yep. Right, cool. So it integrates directly with Zscale. So you can actually, for each app, you say, that's a sanctioned app, that's not a sanctioned app. You can integrate it directly so that you can say, that's not a sanctioned app, it doesn't talk to Zscale straight away, lock that app for everyone. You don't have to worry about, oh, what's the URLs for this application? What's the IPs? How do I configure custom exceptions? Just out of the box, you go block that app, talk to it directly. If you don't have Zscaler, you can say, I have a Fortinet firewall or wherever your firewall is, and say export, and exports a script that you can run against your firewall to go block those apps. Okay, cool. Let's push on and show them the tracking. Here's the activity box. So here's every oh, activity. Got a question. So as I understood, this portal is basically monitoring and logging portal, which through which we can monitor what is the current traffic is going on, as well as we can control as well as logging. But actual device, which will be either Fortinet, Cisco, or whatever firewall will be there, that will be on premises or anywhere wherever the traffic is there. Now, many times means like a firewall will analyze up to layer four only. So how will analyze the application level traffic? Like, is it the Skype traffic based on the port only, or the is there any other technology we are using? Based on the URL, it's going to. Yeah, it's all but, it's all URL based. So, so it's it's, it's you're feeding it the log, right? It runs its analysis over. That log will generally be a URL and a port combination. And the firewall logs. Yeah, it's reading your firewall logs. Yeah. Now. As you just spoken, you can integrate that with the Zscale, which is a cloud proxy service, pretty much, right? If you look at that app and then go, okay, I want to block that on my Fortinet, it will give you a rule set script that you can plug it back into your Fortinet. So you've got that control there. But the 
logic and technology uses to map it, I'm, I don't know, I'm not going that deep. Yeah. I agree, yeah. but means only thing I is concerned, I mean, I am not understanding is, suppose I have retired log from my Cisco ASA. Yeah. Uh, Cisco ASA is just giving me log, like what is the source, what is the destination. It will not give me up to the layer 7, like what application actually it's working. It's giving up to the OSI layer 4, but like what IP address, what port. How it will be identified, okay, this is the port, means this application, is there any just a port based mapping? So if anyone use the, any tunneling protocol, they can bypass this thing. They're not going through their service, they're going through your, your file. Yeah, it's not going through the service. No. It doesn't go through this. No. This is just getting an extract of what went through your firewall and sending it to Microsoft. If they're tunneling and your firewall can't see it, then this thing can't see it. Yeah. But yeah. So there are still ways to bypass, right? Uh, well, like, this isn't protecting you. This, this is just showing you. It's discovery. Got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not protecting you. Yeah. Um, There's what, a third function that where you can extend it with the scaler, or a th another function where they support some services like ServiceNow, Dropbox, Google, Salesforce, where this can act to be that gateway based on your identity. It doesn't matter what tunnel you go through. So that's when it can do it. It's only a very limited subset. Yeah. We're not going to focus on that today. Next thing we're going to show is how this integrates with AIP. But there is ways when it's being extended to be kind of more of that access gateway, but it's not its, not its core function. No, no it's that cool? You can, oh, apart from your cool. firewall logs, you can also configure it to Windows Defender, Windows 10 logs can yeah. automatically be sent to it as well. So that means someone's on a corporate device, they go home, you can still see what they're doing while they're at home on that device. Yeah. Um, cool. So here's your activity logs, automatically plugs into Microsoft Services, OneDrive, SharePoint, uh, Azure um, itself, obviously, and you can see anything that's happening in the environment, who's logging on from where. Um, but even better is you can even view the files mode and you can see, okay, what's happening in terms of the files in, say, SharePoint, OneDrive, and you'll see all the uh, relevant stuff I was just doing with those things about who accessed it. So that's, that's that demo that just went on, right? Uh, the files that we just integrated with and did with in our demo and we can see all the activity behind that file so we should see every time it was open saved you know downloaded whatever we can see every transaction the location what the device what was the ip address what was the date we can take an action we can do all sorts of cool public stuff with it i can even go to a user and say show me all the activity for that user so if you've got someone who's resigned and you go oh uh what they do in their last week or last couple yeah. of days, did they start yeah. uploading lots of data to, to Dropbox or uh, or deleting data for that matter? Did just show us so you can go back on the file itself uh, yeah. on the activity log. Just just go to a file and just show us the actions you can take on this file. Okay. So if you're related alerts, apply classification label to it now, put it in quarantine. Uh, and uh, I think if it was can we also um, revoke access from this part here? I don't believe so. Pretty sure you can. Go to that clab. So you got the collaborators. Click on the collaborator. No, oh, it's internal. That's why. Yeah, it's got access. But there's ways to revoke it from this this client as well. Maybe not that view. I've certainly done it before. Does this mean if you? Uh if you apply at a file a classification, yep. that regardless of that classification, whoever is getting access to the cloud app security and the logs can now see information about that file. They, can see all they the, can't get the contents, no, but if content. you wanted to hide the file even existed, yeah. like you've got protected classified documents or sensitive, yeah. is there a way to purge it from getting into this log so that your IT administrators can suddenly see that these files existed? Um, you can always see the files exist. You can't view the contents. As of uh, about a week and a half ago, um, if you had protected and encrypted the file, MCAS couldn't even read the contents of it. So if you wanted to say, show me all the files that contain the word private, for instance, MCAS couldn't have done that. Now you can enable that where you actually register an application against MCAS to well, say, it's, it's I, more, the, I don't want my IT is, admins who can get access yeah. to this in the firewall logs to actually see files that are not this, within their purview. So, so just to clarify, you're seeing this without the firewall logs. This is not firewall logs. But any any logging on a yeah. on an enterprise network, yeah. if you've got a division within your um, organisation that has sensitive documentation that shouldn't be 
accessible by your IT group, regardless of them being IT administrators, security administrators. This now gives them evidence of the document existing. What you probably want is RBAC for MCAS. Is that pretty much what you're after? You want role-based access control. You can at least say over the portal, don't show the view of that particular sensitive data to these people. Yeah. Yeah. Is that possible? Uh, you know what? I've never played with custom roles. There are roles in there. Whether you can create uh, custom roles, I'm not sure. That's one for your That's And that is certainly, uh, no one's ever asked me that if, before. If you want, why don't, why don't we post the question in the, in the um, AOP uh, user yeah, uh, product that. group. Yeah. There's a pretty active uh, Yammer internal product group inside Robson, for lots of partners. It's, we can certainly ask the question in there. Yeah. If you've got a business card, or give me details, I'll try and get back to you. <laughs> Which one? Which day? No, yeah, yeah, I was yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. But so, we, we have to deal with protected class five stuff, so we yeah. have to lock out our IT group from our stuff. Oh, yeah. So I'm like, um, lock them out. Sure. Because yeah, we've had to lock them out of Azure as well. Yeah. And this yeah. would be. So I doubt it's uh, not on their roadmap if the, the features are already there. Yeah. Um, so apart from discovery, you can also. Uh, add alerts and also governance. So obviously alerting when when this happens, alert me, but also governance, which means you can actually put users in the quarantine, so they can't do any more actions. You can put documents in the quarantine. So what you can do here, I'll share some examples. Uh, I've got a real setup. Show me, show me all external files that are shared with anonymous links. So that's the ones where you don't need authentication to access. 63, we've got those. And so you can hit that, and it shows you all the files with that access. Now, I haven't got any actions. I'll take my word for that. That's there. Um, I haven't got any actions. You'll see some actions in the action column. These ones here, have, mean, that means alert, and that means action. So I've got a ransomware activity. This is a built-in one. And this basically says, ah, that looks like ransomware activity. It's going in encrypting all your files. I'm going to... Uh, let's see, I'll show you what I've configured on there. So by default, that rule exists, but has no actions. So I've said, ah, send me an email, but I've got no, oh, and suspend the user who's doing that from doing any more actions. Cool. So rule, rule base, match it to business needs. You can report, doesn't have to go back to IT, those reports can go back to anybody in the business who needs to know about these things, about a breach or about a certain behaviour pattern or a type of sharing or a type of activity. Uh, you get the discovery piece, and it's just a way to give you that more overarching view of the transactions that are happening in your environment and across the services, which is great. It's not 365 specific. A couple more slides to go and then I'll let you guys go. No, uh, switch back. Just on the deployment guidance and tips and tricks from people who've burnt their fingers trying to um, deploy this stuff. Can we flip back? Yep. Share this again and put two. Uh, MCAS links directly into AIP, grabs all the labels. So as soon as you create the labels in AIP, you can automatically uh, create rule sets based on those. And you can use MCAS to apply those labels to say, uh, we've, I've done it for a client where they said every time someone saves a document in this file document library, automatically, if it doesn't have a label already, apply this label and it applies protection. So if the user has forgotten to apply a classification and that's shared externally, it says I'm going to go automatically apply this label. All right. So graduate deployment is best. Start with classifications, then add protection, right? Better than don't try and protect everything at once. It's going to be a bit hard. Just get used to the system and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, use an existing corporate classification policy. Don't reinvent the wheel. <coughs> don't have too many classifications. You want about four or five, else it's going to get a bit crazy. Um, uh, and, you know, start with one department. Don't start at the top. I mean, there is one to just go internal. That's a really simple one. It's actually really easy. And it can never leave, and you can, you can know what that scope is. Uh, if it, the policy doesn't exist, create it first a consultation from the business. It's not an IT defined function, it's business, they're going to come and tell you what it should be. Right? There, there is default groups, they may be sufficient. There's an confidential, there's an internal, there's a public, maybe that's good to start. File a small department first, HR is a good one, they've typically got information they don't want shared. 
uh, and put adoption and change measures. What are we talking about? We're talking about awareness campaign, communications, testing and training and involvement from the business. Don't just roll it out and expect we all know how to use it. So some tips and tricks. Find marketing space on user attributes. What do you mean by that, Simon? Oh, so I actually didn't get one of those labels. When you apply it, it actually says applied by, and you can actually use uh, user attributes. So you can say applied by name of the user. So what you can do, if you want to put a watermark across something you are, are classified by a company, to, to you want to limit it to one company, you say this was restricted just to this company of using this label. Uh, and that way, if it does get out and someone has taken photos of it, it's got that watermark in there you know of leaks from. Who, who leaked it. I know that uh, a classic example, not AIP related directly, but I was watching an illegal movie one time and it kept coming up as um, they blur out who was leaking it down the bottom and they forgot one and Ellen DeGeneres was gladly enough to share that <laughs> video with everyone. So uh, they, they missed uh, blurring that one out. All right. Uh, make default labels for per app. Use your default label and outlook is similar to Word. Just makes it easy if you understand what they're doing. Uh, MCAS can apply open classification on download eGRI. So if you use it for session proxy for the for 18 to 20 apps they do support, as I mentioned before, Dropbox, Salesforce, Blah, OWA, OWA and, and SharePoint, it can actually do that for you as the function rather than. So you don't it. store the document with protection. You say when the person downloads it, that's when you apply the protection to it, yeah. based on where that person's coming from. Uh, you can fit it logs from files and what is defender. We talked about that. Uh, you can link with Zscale, which is fantastic, and license six. And how do you get this stuff? So P1, and we're talking Azure. That, that would be AIP P1. Yeah, AIP P1. You get all the features, but manual classification. No auto classification based on regular expressions, keywords, blah, blah, blah. Uh, P2 has that function. And if you want to get MK, you can buy the separate scoop, but it's under the E5 EMS or M365 E5 uh, bundle. Some limitations, okay? You can't classify document in Office Online. It's coming. Okay, cannot open protect content in Office Online. If you saw that, it doesn't work, it's coming. Uh, I'm sure those two will come at the same time, right? You, you don't want to classify and if you can't open it, that'd be pretty <laughs> crazy. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, did you have a question? No, no you cannot option, uh, open it, but it gives open to you know, Microsoft Open uh, image or various applications. So anyhow, you have work around. This way, as long as you've got an office client, yeah. It's not your user friendly. <laughs> so apply labels via mobile apps and release now. So at the moment, the app experience is a view only, but you'll be able to actually interact and classify soon. No, you can do that now. I oh, can do it now, sorry. Uh, ability to open has been released for Android iOS, which is what we've got now. So you don't need a separate um, application. Uh, there is those still the free viewer you can install of that function. Uh, just one thing we didn't mention that we all talked about Office documents. You can encrypt other types of documents yeah. as well. PDF. JPEGs, PNGs, PDFs. PDFs. Yeah. They used to rename the PDFs to PPDF. But that broke something. So now any PDFs remain as PDFs. Yeah. And integration directly with Adobe is coming. In fact, I think it's already out in the last version of Adobe. You can open protected um, AIP documents from the last um, Adobe Reader. I'm sure there'll be more and more, more and more coming. Uh, not the best for non-AD uh, organisations. If you're going to share with them, we talked about that. But you can always get a free directory. It's no cost to set up a hybrid sync to at least have an identity to share it with for a third party. Can be a bit slow sometimes. Uh, generally, it's within 15 minutes. You saw the content from today was up in MCAS straight away. The SLA is 24 hours. Never waited that long. Sometimes, Never. sometimes it can be a little bit slow. Uh, you need the client. So that little banner that we, we were clicking those classification buttons, that's an add-in to the Office, but I'm sure they're going to roll it in. The client's pretty easy to, to download and install and roll out whatever various uh, method you've got. Just back on that MCAS is a bit slow. It's actually trigger based. So if you have a lot of documents in, in SharePoint or OneDrive and then you enable MCAS, it pretty much won't go back and relearn and dump all the data from there. People have to have an activity on those, whether it's an open or even just a view properties. It triggers something in the background that MCAS being acts on. Any other questions? We'll catch you a, bit, a little bit late. We started a little bit late too, but any questions? How about the course? Cost. Cost. 
How you buying it? I mean, you know, <laughs> EA, is it CSP, have you got it in a bundle? So back on that slide before, you'll get it. So you'll get it in the EMS suite. If you have EMS, you've got a flavour of this already. If you've got E5 EMS, you've got the full singing or dancing version of it, right? Uh, if you've got M365 E5, you've got every element of it. But you can still buy these individually. The best way to buy these things is in the About 12 months ago, it was about six Australian dollars for Cloud Up Security, six dollars uh, for AIP P1, and I think it was about eleven dollars for P2. So you're 15 bucks a month per user. If you add that on top of, a, of what you've got, you might as well bought a bundle and you've got your Windows 10 licensing and you've got all these other funky things. So you only got to buy two, two or three things outside of uh, an E3 or an E1, and you start going, "This is silly. I need to." Upgrade to a bundle. If you're under an EA, you can do step up SKU. So I don't really want to talk about license too much. Heaps of ways of life that probably sitting at around ten dollars a user. But remember, you're going to get other features with that. It's not just those two products. If you buy the bundles, you'll get you buy a bundle and you get all these other features. You'll get MFA. You'll get part. You'll get identity protection. You'll get all these other funky things. If you don't need conditional access alone, I think it's yeah. paid for by itself and in as your AD premium. So if you're getting AD Premium, you may as well at least get one of the other, and uh, the others. So EMS is a no-brainer if you want AD Premium. Yeah. Who's doing conditional access at the moment to some degree? Fantastic. I suggest that's your next session because it's just it's as cool as this stuff. Uh, just quickly, I was actually going to I did bring up some slides about SKUs and licensing if you want. So really, it's under this banner. Uh, sits under the EMS uh, line if you like. Um, you need you need premium for it, and you need AIP premium. What's this for? You can't have AIP without with a basic um, Azure AD. Right? Yeah, you can. Get, you no, can. Okay. You can. Right. So yeah, E3. If you got EMS or in the bundle, you get it, which is cool. E5 adds on top of that, right? Uh, the advanced, the P2 features, the cloud app security, which I think for me is. Can't really get one without the other. You need AOP, you need it as together, and the defender, which you can grab for data security as well, and obviously the voice element, the start teams calling, and Power BI Pro. A lot of people go on E5 at the moment. I have three tenders on the go right now for E5. Price point's pretty awesome. If you manage to leverage all, some part of all of those things, really competitively priced. If you bought them individually, they'd be nearly double the price. Um, a lot of people going Cloud Voice. A lot of people want to do Power BI Pro. Anybody know what that trap is? Want to share it? They're just for sharing with these pros. Everybody. They're pretty clever with these Microsoft licensing people. Uh, so that's kind of how it sits there. And I guess the other point is, is that you know, as a platform, you know, that's the compliance worldwide for Azure and 365. It's pretty impressive. You see down the bottom there, there's IRAP, which is now for protected mode. And you've got NG, uh, NZ GCIO as well. If you can comply with even just those ISO standards, I'd be, I'd be impressed. Um, so thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for uh, having us, Adam. Really appreciate it. Thanks for giving us the time. Any last minute questions? Are we have pushed over for time? We'll, we'll be well, around. We'll hang around. The beats should be out there. So feel free to hang around. Yeah, we'll be around. Um, also, because you're from Dynatom, if anyone wants to contact you and follow up further or have a discussion or anything, yeah, um, good point. I actually have some jobs in the market and you say I'm looking for people that are either know this stuff, know Skype and Teams, know anything 365. We're a pretty cool company, we're pretty fair employer, we're a good company to work for. We're just down on Franklin Street in Brand New it's pretty funky. I am looking for smart, intelligent people that want to do cool things to the customers. Jobs on the SEEK website. Go and hit us up and have a chat. Or come and talk to me afterwards if you like. Cool. So yeah, I guess if you forget anything message me and I can pass any details. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, um, mate. Worries. Thanks very much. Thank you for joining us at the IT Pro community. I want to give a big shout out to our sponsors, Microsoft and Sorison, your System Center experts. If you want to see more, subscribe to our channel and click the bell to get notified when we put up new content. And feel free to leave your suggestions for future events in the comments below. For more details on upcoming events or to join us live at our next meeting, Join our meetup community at the link provided.